Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Paranormal Portal. I'm your host, Brent Thomas, and I hope you guys are doing great out there in your world. I hope it's warming up for all of you. It's gotten a little bit warmer here. It actually got below zero a little bit, so uh, <laughs> that was an epic on the suck scale. I just want to say that up right up front. But thank you all for joining us, and uh, for or me, as you're stuck with just me tonight. But we're going to be bringing on a, a special friend to the show here in just a couple minutes. But we got a lot to get through tonight. We got some uh, epic news. We're going to go back into some of those over-the-road truck stories and some strangeness from Phantoms and Monsters, some crop circle information, and more. So it's just an epic helping of the strange and bizarre that you love so much that you keep coming back. So I uh, hope you guys are doing great. Uh, how, UFO Bigfoot, that's a new name. Good to see you, Brian Gasker. Good to see you, Sugar Britches. Rachel gets it right. The unknown Android Purity, Elaine, Maggie, Sugar Britches again. I'm just looking at the names that are popping up. Tracy Haas, hello. All of you guys, thank you so much for coming in and being a part of the show. Great to see you. As always, we got two full hours ahead of us, so I don't know about you all, but I'm about ready to dig right in. So um, all I can say is, hang on, it's about to get spooky. The boom. That was the boom, ladies and gentlemen. That means it's official. We are underway here on the Paranormal Portal. Hello, Fourth Color. Saw you come in. Uh, Malaya Gr Grimm. Good to see you. That's a new name as well. I love seeing the new names. That's exciting because, you know, I love all of you regulars as well. Don't get me wrong, but it just warms my heart something special to uh, see new people coming and exploring the show. Uh, you know, I know it's, it's uh, getting around and people are starting to learn about it, so that's always exciting. Now, I'm trying to bring our, our special guest who's going to join us for about 10 minutes here on the show and talk about some really exciting projects that are coming up and uh, just going to see if we can get it all worked out and uh, see if it can connect here. I don't know. I'll try it. We'll see what's going on. On one moment, we're going to call him. See if he's if he's out there in, in the ethers. Did you hear that feedback? <laughs> that was weird. I don't know what the hell goes on with all this technology stuff. There's buttons and switches and levers and all kinds of fun that I probably shouldn't be allowed to touch too much. But 
I'm the only one here, so I have no uh, I have no boundaries, as it turns out. So I'm uh, just reaching out and calling, but maybe we'll have to come back to this. Uh, he's not connecting right now. Um, let's see what he says here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm messaging him right now. Yeah. Mm hmm. Hmm. But no answer. Gotta love technologies, right? I can't say the show's ever perfect, ladies and gentlemen. If you're brand new to the show, get used to this because this is this is how we roll in the portal. But uh yeah, unfortunately it's not he's not connecting, so um I don't know what's going on for sure. Hopefully we'll get this all sorted. I, I didn't see him come online on, on his Skype, and, and uh, that's how we're going to be connecting. So we'll keep working at it. Um, unfortunately, there are no producers. I was like, I am host, producer, uh, technical uh, uh, troubleshooter, and uh, entertainer, hopefully, if I'm doing my job. So i um, not sure what's going on. It doesn't look like it's online, though. Very strange. Hopefully he'll connect here in just a, just a minute or two. Um, I don't know. It's strange all over the place. But how are you guys doing? Everything going good out there in your world? Everybody having a good week? It's hump day, so you've made it through uh, the rough part of the week, I hope. And uh, now you got the downhill slide. You're over halfway point on the work week, and you're working towards the weekend. So um, as far as I know, that's about the best times is, is when you're getting towards that weekend. Um, we'll see what's going on. By the way, we do have a we do have an unboxing to do on the show tonight. There's an unboxing. It turns out uh, I received the package at the at the studio here, which also serves as my home. But it sounds cooler if I say studio. And uh, we'll uh, <laughs> have to see just what is in the box. I don't even know. And to be honest, with you, honest with you, honest to God, all I did was cut the tape so I could open it live on the show. I have not peeked. I haven't looked. I don't know what's in this box. But it came all the way from New, to, from New Zealand, so uh, it's made the journey across the globe, and uh, well, I'm kind of excited to get into that. So, buckle up; that's going to be pretty interesting. <laughs> I'm not sure uh, what is in there, but the last thing that uh, this person sent, and it's of course our dear friend Nessie over in New Zealand. Last time she sent the figurines. I don't know if you can see them up there, but there's a little me. Uh, she crafts stuff like crazy. She's brilliant at crafting. And she also made a small miniature portal studio, so <laughs> which is just brilliant. And uh, that, unfortunately, I don't have room to set up here, but I've got it carefully packed away in a box. Uh, you know, I got to find a home for that because it was just brilliant. So uh, we'll do the unboxing in a little bit here, trying to figure out why the phone is not connecting. Huh. He's calling me. I'm not getting his call either. That's not working. Ay, 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 ay. Let me just try again. We'll see if we can connect once again. Try and see. I'll just try again. Uh, see if we can get him on the line here. Otherwise, we're going to have to call his phone. We'll just do it by phone. I'll try this this way once again. I will... Call your phone. Phone. So I'd love to have had him on the on the camera here with us, but it's just not connecting. So let's do it a different way, shall we? Yeah, it's just not going to connect this way, unfortunately. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have connected in the past on Skype. I don't know what the problem is currently, but there's something askew. So let me just do this. Let me just call the... Uh, the actual number, and we'll get them on this way. Um, that's not going to work. Hold on. What in, the, what in the hell's going on, folks? That's why you love this show, right? <laughs> Isn't that why? Or one of the reasons why? Let me just get this all dialed in here. Uh, i got to use this. That's right. Uh, two, do, do, do. Yeah, I'd love to have a producer. That'd make things so slick. And I could say, hey, get, get so-and-so on the phone. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not that big yet here on the portal, so let's see if this will work for us and at least get us connected. 
Hopefully this will work and we can we can talk. We're sorry. You have reached a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service. Well, I know If you feel you have reached this recording <laughs> in error, please check the number and try your call again. Well, that didn't work right. Let me try that call again. <laughs> Oh my God. I, I thought I dialed it right, right? No, I didn't. Okay, let's try it again. Uh, let me pull up the contact information here. It looked right. I must have screwed up something. Okay, let's try it again. All right. All right, trying it again, folks. We're going to get this connection one way or the other. By God. We're sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, too. That's not working. I don't know why that's not working. That's weird. We talk regularly on this. Very strange. Very, very, very strange. What in the hell is going on? I guess we could go really old school. <laughs> Do I just do speaker? I don't understand. That's very weird. I don't know, folks. This is the uh, the most uh, uninteresting start to a show. Don has uh, been under the weather, folks, so he's not in tonight. Oh, he's calling me. Well, let's get this sorted now. All right. I'm going to put him on speaker. Well, hello there. Are you there? Hello? Hello? Oh. Yeah, we're having some real technical difficulties. I'm trying to call your Skype, but it's not connecting. Hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you a commercial break for a second. We'll be right back. Just a sec. Okay. okay.
All right, folks, I think I have a solution now. Hopefully we'll get this underway. Um, this is going to be, uh, it's, you know, it's unfortunate. I don't know. I don't know why things are so convoluted sometimes. They shouldn't ought to be. Uh, I will just give him the, the call-in number. Call in two seven two zero nine two three and then zero five. All right, I'm gonna have him connect to the regular phone line here on the show and we'll talk to him that way and then get into the news and such that he has to share. Um it's gonna be great stuff. It's just um, unfortunately, I don't know why Skype is uh, Skype updated, and it's been absolutely bat crazy since then, and nothing that makes any sense. Even it's just a, a typical Microsoft update. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It keeps you, it keeps you going. But Extreme Expeditions, if you would call in to the studio, I would appreciate it. Seven two zero nine two three zero five zero zero. Again, 720-923-0500. Zero dash. Whoops. Oops. <laughs> I didn't want that yet. I'm using the wrong buttons here. 720-923-0500. Um, well, there it is. It's posted. There he is. All right. Let's get him on the horn here and find out just what's going on. Welcome to the show, brother. Sorry for all the mishaps and mayhem that make up the show, but uh, it's kind of the, you know, the Murphy's Law. Oh, do I have you now? You have me. I'm all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet, man. Dude, no, I, I, you know, I hate that Skype stuff anyways. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I know, and it's a pain. It's an absolute pain, but thanks for coming on the show and sharing some big news with our listeners. I'm really excited about no, all this. No, man, we got huge stuff, and I want to tell your listeners right now, they are getting an exclusive, and I mean an exclusive. Excellent, brother. So where do we begin? Well, dude, we've got so much going on right now. And I have to step away from my computer screen because I'm watching you right now, and then <laughs> the audio gets messed up. So Sure, yeah, whatever um, you got to do. No, well, first of all, what I'd like to share with, with everybody, all of your listeners tonight, is that I want to talk about the upcoming show that we're doing called Cryptid Talk on Spokane Talks Media. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Let me unveil yeah. this. Yeah. And I want to talk about who the hosts of the show are going to be. Yours truly, Brent Thomas and Mitch the Man Johnson, who you may have seen from Bigfoot Today. Oh, excellent. That's going to be exciting. I'm really pumped about this. <laughs> this is going to be great going forward. Dude, I, I'm totally pumped about it because it, it, it's new. We've got you on board with it, and we're going to be having some of the best, so, not some of the best. We're going to be having the best encrypted research investigation on the show, and you're going to be talking with them about what their latest research is and their plans for the future and what they're going to be doing. And then on top of that, it's powered by Cryptid Coin. Amen. <laughs> That's Which a, the sole purpose of Cryptic Coin is to be funding cryptid research and investigation for around you know, the world, yeah. Credit in, absolutely. And that's so and I we're I, we're looking forward to that. Absolutely. And and I, I really want to thank you for letting me be a part of that venture. I, I'm really excited going forward and into jumping into all of that because a, one, it'll be great to talk to all these individuals about what they're doing and, of course, to bring it to the audiences that happen to tune in. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this gentleman we're speaking to, Mr. Stephen Majors, is the, he's the, uh, the brain uh, behind this cryptid coin that I've been talking to you guys about for weeks. And uh, what an exciting deal. And a lot of, a lot of research is going to be funded that way, right? Well, see, that's the biggest thing, Brent. You're right on. The The biggest thing that's inhibiting research right now mm -hmm. is funding, yeah. you know, and, the, and and we need to bring in the money for all those fantastic, there's a 
ton of them mm -hmm. that are really good researchers out there that have a lot of things going on and they're really close to bringing to fruition some proof definitive proof of these creatures that exist out there mm -hmm. but the number one thing when i talk to these guys they're lacking they're lacking funding because it costs money for dna analysis you know it costs money for travel it costs money for a number of things and that's really what they're lacking in Unfortunately, cryptozoology is still pseudoscience, so it doesn't really bring in, um, you know, the big funding from universities and whatever that would further the research. And so the evolution of the cryptic coin is to raise funding for these people primarily, really, to raise funding for these people so they have the dollars they need to go out there and do their research, whether it be for Dogman or it be for uh, the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, uh, the Yeti, whatever. And I think this is really what we need. They need money to do these things. And what we really need is to be able to bring people together in the crypto community, raise the funds that we need to fund these people to go out and do the research that they're good at. That's the bottom line. That really is. And, and you're right. That's probably the biggest stumbling block right now because it's it's all fun, self-funded uh, currently and people have limited resources and even more so, so now with all of the, the global events going on. I mean, people are trying so hard to make ends meet as it is, but they're still going out there and looking because this is something they love. So it's really cool. No, and they are. And let me tell you right now, there are, I mean, we're not talking, we're talking about revolutionized funding for crypto research investigation. But on top of that, do you know, and I can't share anything personally, names or anything like that, there are a number of groups out there right now that are sitting on what they believe is Bigfoot DNA. Wow. And they've been holding it because they can't get, they can't get the money to have it tested. Wow. Because it costs like $7,000 to do it. And nobody will give the, And some of these people have been holding on to this stuff mm -hmm. for like two and three years. Oh, amazing. And yeah. they can't get the money to do it. We want to give it to them. That's phenomenal. I'm really excited to be a part of that. I know that's. Yeah. I had no idea that there was so much stuff that people were holding on to right now. But they can't get the money to do it. Right. And, uh, you know, I've heard the stories of people sitting on, you know, even even imagery and stuff that they, they're not ready to put out and, and maybe for any number of reasons. But uh, but that, I think that it will it will it'll really authenticate and substantiate cryptid research going forward because it won't just be some guy dealing with the trunk of his car and what he's got in it. Now, now they could go out with state of the art equipment or, you know, or, or those resources. And, yeah. And, and hopefully find what it is they need. Oh, exactly. So that that's just that. Uh, I know you don't have a lot of time here. So okay. you know that's that's an example of what we want to fund. We want to be able to raise the money through crypto coin for these people, so that we can give them the money, so they can actually get this stuff tested, and you know whatever, and see see what it proves. There's a lot of and there's other people with other other evidence as well and things like that. But it needs to be validated. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing how much money it costs to do it. So sure. we want to raise money for that and further that. Absolutely. What a noble, no, what a noble cause. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm so proud that cryptid coin is sponsoring the show as well. So thank you so much for that, Stephen, And thank you for coming on the show tonight and, and introducing these new concepts. I, I I'm really excited. I, I would be. And then I know you don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to share you. This is breaking news. This is wonderful. You guys are going to love it. Listen in on this one. Okay. Okay. So our next expedition that we're going to be doing is not something that I thought we'd be doing, but we're doing it because it sounds like a good thing to do. We're going to be going to Lake Iliama, Alaska, mm. and we're going to be doing the most thorough investigation of the Lake Iliama monster that anyone has ever been done before. Wow. And we're going to be doing that on July 5th through the 10th, of this year oh phenomenal so folks need to pay attention to that one because it's going to be a big deal and i would like to say right now that i can tell you some people that are on the team and i'm sure everybody knows who ken gerhardt is sure. he's the expedition leader oh, he's going to be leading this expedition and i will be accompanying him and i'm hoping that 
you, my friend, will be able to go along with us on this one because <laughs> it's going to be good. Oh, that would be epic. I, I, I'd be good for it. I, I'd, I'd love to be on that journey. Um, but yeah, that's that's exciting. And and that's also a region up there with a lot of uh, big Bigfoot Sasquatch sightings, eh? Well, you know, that's the thing that it really is. Around that Lake Iliama area, mm-hmm. they there is a lot of sightings of Bigfoot, the hairy man, the Nantadoc, whatever ever you want to call them on that. But that's not the focus. We're trying to stay focused. You know me. Primarily, <laughs> I'm a Bigfoot guy. Sure. I mean, that's what I'm after. But uh, this trip, you know, we're we're going to be... Uh, we know we're going to be there for five days out there, and we're going to we're going to incorporate a lot of the research, and we're going to be shooting a documentary film about the trip out there, and everything that we're doing. But we're also going to be spending a lot of time with the native folks in the area there, and if an opportunity presents itself that may show us a little more evidence on the Nantadoc, we're not going to turn that down. <laughs> Amen, brother. That's all I can say. Well, that's that's awesome news, and and yeah, keep us posted about that. That's exciting. Yeah. So, um, in closing, I would encourage all of your listeners to please go to www.crypticoin.io. Get yourself set up with a MetaMask wallet. Invest in some crypto coins so that we can further cryptid research investigation that we're doing here, mm-hmm. and you'll be happy with the results. Absolutely. Wow. Well, thank you, brother, for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, by all means, anytime you want to come on, just let me know. Uh, hopefully, I'll be a little better at it next time. <laughs> no, man, it was good, man. No, thanks a lot. And seriously, thank you so much for having me on the show. I, I enjoy it, and I listen to it all the time. And uh, I guess we'll be seeing you tomorrow, my friend. All right, brother. Get some rest, and I'll see you then. Take care. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night. Very cool, very cool stuff. So there you go, folks, some exclusive uh, information and some, some background on, on more of the cryptid coin, more than, than, you know, I mean, that's the founder of it. So really excited. And, they, and again, they are sponsors of the Paranormal Portal. So just, uh, you know, if you're able to, that, that investment goes so far into helping the cryptid community if you're able to make it. If you're not, that's fine. Um, but you guys are all uh, already invested in my heart. Okay, now that uh, I hope we've got all the kinks out of the machine here, um, we got a lot more show to get to. And first off, I want to get to the news. So I hope you guys want to be informed because I want to inform you. And it's just you and I tonight, folks, you and me. We're hanging out, and I'll do my best. When and where is the new Cryptid Talk Show uh, again? Also talk about Cryptid Coin Mining. Uh, I don't know anything about mining any kind of cryptocurrency. So I'm just absolutely not qualified to speak on that. I really don't know a lot about it. I just know that, uh, of course, cryptocurrencies uh, seem to be the wave of the future for a lot of people. Uh, not having a, 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 what do they call it? It's a non, 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 what, non centrally located kind of thing. Like with money, there's there's people that control money. And I think with current events, we can see that, Money can be controlled around you and, you know, whether you want to spend it or if someone wants to come in and and, uh, do something to your accounts, it can happen for any number of reasons. And I'm not making this a political discussion, but certainly uh, that is that is a hair raising reality of our common our current age. So um, I know a lot of people are adopting the cryptocurrencies just because it's not supposedly possible to to do that with the cryptocurrency. So. Um, be that as it may, but no, I'm not, I'm not qualified to talk about mining any, anything about cryptocurrencies. I don't know anything about it other than just a rudimentary understanding of what that means. So my apologies for that, but I only have so much knowledge in this head and I try to pack it full of all the weird and paranormal stuff for you guys. (laughs) So. You're supposed to ask him, but I was slow on, on okay, I gotcha. Well, I don't, I, you know, I don't know if that's, ne- the mining is necessarily a part of uh, the conversation to have here. Um, certainly, whatever, whatever mining you might be interested in, you can go online and find out all about it if you want to dedicate the time and resources and, and in the investment and the equipment necessary to do it, then it doesn't matter what the coin is, you can mine it 
being part of that blockchain. So, um, you know, I don't know. But anyway, let's move along and get to some of the news. Let me do one thing first before I forget, because I got a lot of stuff going on in my screens here tonight. It's chock full of articles and things we're going to be talking about because I bring a lot to the plate. I usually don't get to even half of what I bring to each show, but uh, I try. <laughs> so, all right, what the hell am I doing? Where is this? Okay, here it is. This is what I wanted. I'm getting it sorted, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a little slow out of the gate, but I'm damn good by the finish, usually. All right, let's... What the hell? What in the hell? What am I doing? Oh, whoops, that's what I'm doing wrong. Derp. Yeah, if you're on the wrong menu, nothing can work right. All right, there we go. Okay, let's get to the news, folks. See what's going on in the world of the Paranormal Portal News. <laughs> All right, folks, welcome to the Paranormal Portal News Desk, where we have all kinds of strange and weird news just waiting for you. And there's a bunch uh, here. The first one we're going to get into tonight, I, I think this is kind of a cool article, and this is coming from unexplained-mysteries.com. Um, and, and this is a great, a great topic of discussion for, uh, I'm sure, any number of, of circles, whether it's whether it's uh, scientific, whether it's uh, philo philosophical, spiritual, but you have to let me know what you guys think. But the article is, could the earth itself be an intelligent entity? And it's not too long, so we'll find out. <laughs> it says, a new study has looked into the possibility that our planet is not simply a ball of water, metal, and rock. The Earth is the only home we've ever known, but could it really be a singular living being? I love that idea because I think some of the earliest astronauts that went up into orbit looked down and, and made remarks like that, like, oh my God, this is a living planet. And, and I think that's it's a beautiful thought. I, I certainly would be a macro organism for certain, but... I think it could be. I think it could be and maybe is. It says, according to a recent study published in the International Journal of Astrobiology, there may be more to the so-called Gaia hypothesis than it might first appear. Conventionally, in, in, conventionally, intelligence is seen as a property of individuals, wrote study co-author Adam Frank, a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Rochester. However, it is known to be a property of collectives. According to the study, a planet goes through four major stages of development based on the habitability and the emergence of intelligent life. These range from uh, an immature biosphere, which is what the Earth was like billions of years ago, to a mature technosphere, a perfect balance of biology and technological systems. Right now, our civilization is what researchers call an imma immature technosphere, a uh, conglomeration of human-generated systems and technology that directly affects the planet but is not self-maintaining, the study authors wrote in a press release. For instance, the majority of our energy usage involves consuming fossil fuels that degrade Earth's oceans and atmospheres. The technology and, and energy we consume to survive are destroying our home planet, which will in turn destroy our species. Planets evolve through immature and mature stages, and planetary intelligence is indicative of when you get to a mature planet. The, the million-dollar question is figuring out which planetary intelligence looks like and means for us in practice because we don't know how to move to a mature technosphere yet. Well, it's all just, you know, those are all flowery, beautiful ideas, and, and I agree. I think, I, I think honestly, technology is, is, of course, important. Um, to just the way that, that life exists now. Um, information is important to be able to be shared at a moment's notice to anywhere around the world is an exciting possibility. But is there other technologies that aren't being exploited and aren't being explored? And by that I mean spiritual. Is the spirituality a technology in and of itself? Is spiritual awareness uh, a technology of itself? Um, certainly I think there's an argument to be made for that possibility. And if that is the case, then 
perhaps we've already moved out of that perfect space. When you look at the older cultures, they weren't always peaceful with each other, but they did generally live in balance with the world around them. They didn't they didn't uh, overconsume or, or overpopulate. They and maybe by by design they couldn't, just because you know the the medical advances and such were such that uh, you know life was still very fragile. But you know, are there other you know when you look at the past civilizations that lived in balance with the world around them, that's actually very beautiful, and kind of reminds me of that Avatar movie of James Cameron, that that people that cultures that were portrayed in that movie they lived in balance and they've they've they had adapted biologically to become a part of their planet not just a a resident of it and i thought that was really cool and very profound but i don't know maybe it's just all idealistic and may not even be possible who knows but anyway just some interesting ideas is the earth alive yeah i think it is 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 it an intelligence? Yeah, but probably not not what we may envision when we think of intelligence. But at any rate, very cool. Very cool. Maybe there's a celestial intelligence kind of thing, you know? I don't know. Who knows? I just work here. All right, let's go to the next article, and this is from unexplained-mysteries.com, and this is... <laughs> This is a UFO um, uh, incident of some kind, but it's kind of an interesting one. I don't know. I wonder how much money they blow on this if it was just what they say it was. Uh, Again, from unexplained-mysteries.com, F-22 scrambled to intercept mystery balloon off Hawaii. Now, it wasn't too long ago off of Hawaii. Somebody had gotten some footage of what appeared to be a pretty spectacular large blue light over the ocean off the shore, and that light appeared to descend into the ocean. Now, I, I don't know for sure that that's what happened, but that's what it visually looked like. Maybe it moved so far off, far off into the horizon that it looked like it entered the water and maybe just ended up kind of disappearing as the horizon, you know, like a ship disappears, looks like it's sinking as it goes further and further out. But um, perhaps it was just that, but... I don't know. I think Hawaii is a pretty active place uh, for for the uh, UFOs and UAPs and, and submersibles and stuff. So let's see what this says. It says the U.S. tactical fighter jets were sent to intercept a suspicious object near Kauai's north shore. The incident took place on February 14th, saw the F-22s intercept what was believed to be some sort of balloon. Why the hell would they, they scramble the F-22s to intercept a balloon? Really? A balloon? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why you would justify that much of an expense to get a balloon. But let's see what it says. The, it said, uh, however, specific details continue to remain thin on the ground. Indo-Pacific Command detected a high-altitude alt- object floating in air in the vicinity of the Hawaiian Islands, uh, wrote, uh, a, well, who wrote it? The 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 adjutant general of Hawaii, Kenneth S. Hara, wrote on Twitter, In accordance with Homeland Defense procedures, Pacific Air Forces launched tactical aircraft to intercept and identify the object, visually confirming an un- unnamed, unmanned rather balloon without observable identification markings. The mystery was compounded by reports of powerful explosion sounds by locals in the area with an Air Force spokesman later insisting that the responding aircraft did not destroy the balloon. Sightings of the object posted up on social media indicated that a white oblong with two contrails. Why the hell would the the balloon have contrails? Someone who works at aviation here on the island received communications that there were F-22s intercepting a UFO, wrote one member of the Kauai Community Facebook group. I wonder what the fighter pilot saw, it it being a stationary object. The aviation person told me that the UFO is many miles offshore from Princeville, question mark, over the ocean. It remained in one spot for at least 40 minutes. The incident is particularly odd because F-22s are not usually scrambled to intercept something as mundane as a balloon. Yeah. So exactly what the object was remains something of a mystery. It has been speculated that it could have been some sort of intelligence gathering balloon. <laughs> They're just launching, what is this, World War One? 
<laughs> Throw out the intelligence balloons. We got to get more information. However, it still remains unclear who might have launched it or why it was being intercepted. As things stand, no definitive explanation for the incident has been found. Um, there's apparently some some information uh, in this video from Noah Esvelin, but I don't know. We're not gonna not gonna spend time with that. I don't buy that it was a balloon because I I just think that why the hell would they send up F twenty twos to get a balloon? Even if that's even if they weren't sure what it was. Why F-22s? I mean, wouldn't a helicopter have been better? Like, hey, let's let's send a helicopter out there or something. I don't know. I mean, F-22s is like, it's like getting a cannon to check on the noise outside, you know? <laughs> it's like, that's a pretty big response to just uh, an anomalous object in the sky. But, I don't know. Again, who knows? You guys will have to let me know what you think about that. I'm thinking cover story. We're back to what Roswell kind of cover stories. Um, and, and the booms could have been sonic booms from the aircraft. Could have been something getting shot down. I don't know. It's anybody's guess, but that's, that's all kinds of creepy. All kinds of creepy. But anyway, there you have it. That's another article on our newscast for this evening. Oops, I should go to this one, shouldn't I? Nobody's sitting over there. You got the empty chair over there. I always go to the wrong camera because I'm used to being with uh, company here. I have just you guys and me. I hope that's good. <laughs> Do you think it was a balloon? I don't think it was a balloon. That doesn't wash for me, folks. All right, let's go to the next one. And this is, let's see what we're doing here. All right, let me close this. Somehow I keep getting these pop-up ads on here. I mean, I love this site. They do a great job. Unexplained-mysteries.com. If you like paranormal and, and uh, odd news, definitely check it out. Unexplained-mysteries.com. The next one up is, this one is actually a video. We might have to check out this video, folks. Pet Shop Films Ghosts Throwing toy, toy, Dog Toys Around. Okay. The staff of a pet shop in Coventry, England, was so fearful of the resident spook that they aren't, they don't, they daren't, daren't, I've never heard that word, daren't, as in dare not, work alone. According to owner Rebecca Harrington, Purdy's pet shop is haunted by at least one ghost that has made its presence known by way of causing things to fly around and fall from shelves. Some customers have reported experiencing an, an unexplained tugging on their clothes and some animals have been known to freak out upon entering. Footage recorded via CCTV even shows objects falling from the shelves for no apparent reason. We were in the shop, but we were nowhere near the shelf, said Harrington, when the toy fell, and we were just stood there looking at each other as, as it was a stable shelf. We're, we, we've got a bit of history. Weird things started happening about two months after we opened. We walked in one day and there was a toy on the floor, which we thought was strange because it looked like it had been placed there. We checked the CCTV and saw that it had just flown off the shelf and then spun on the floor about three, for about three minutes. Wow. As things stand, no explanation for the ghostly goings-on at the store has been forthcoming. That's really weird. Uh, I guess we can look at it, but I want to mute it. Um, we'll just watch and see. Look, there's the yellow. Oh, boom. Fell off all by itself. Let's look at that again. Yeah, I mean, it could be. It looks like a bag of something that wasn't really on the shelf very well anyway. So is that anomalous that it shifted off there? Eh. I mean, it could be, but it also could just be normal. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's mostly not on the shelf. I mean, it's like a bag of planters peanuts or something, right? But you can see the way it's positioned. It's mostly not on the shelf. I mean, no offense. I, I, I love for these things to be real, too. Wow, that was a little more weird. Wow, just fell off on the top there. Now, they do look like they got a lot of stuff stacked up there, but um, who knows about any tremors or anything. Uh, it's broken. They got a broken Hoover. Every vacuum is called a Hoover in the UK, I guess. Uh, we can't get it off. Hmm. Okay. I don't know what's up with the, with the the with the vacuum, but that's strange. Hmm. 
just <laughs> just have to kick it until it stops. So they got this this cordless uh, vacuum that won't shut off, and it's absolutely dead, but it won't shut off. So that's very strange, huh? Well, whatever the case is, could it be real? Sure, sure. I I think having a ghost of vacuums would be a great thing. <laughs> it might even be on my bucket list. I'm just saying. That might be the most awesome haunting ever. But there you have it. That's the haunted ghost uh, at the pet shop or the dog shop or whatever it is. Very strange. All right. Here we go with another haunted house story from unexplained-mysteries.com. And this is, let me close the ad. Uh, f- here it is. Owner of haunted house reveals its dark secrets. What are the dark secrets? Caroline Humphreys has once uh, has lived in one of England's most haunted houses for the better part of five decades. Wow. Originally built in the, all the way back in, in 1145 AD, the unsettling abode, which is known as the Ancient Ram Inn, is situ- situated in Watton under Edge in the Stroud district of Gloucestershire, England. Now, that's also the same location that Ghost Adventures went to ages ago. When, when Nick Groff was still part of the team and, and Aaron and, and Zach, and <laughs> they did all kinds of weirdness over there. Even had this lady snake, this, this, this I don't know, parent. She was kind of a, a witch of some sort. Do, do some spells and stuff to make the activity even more insane. And I don't know. I mean, they caught some things over there. I, I'm sure the place is plenty active and such. But, I, I, you know, the thing with, with hauntings is, it's not like an amusement park. It's not like the Disney Haunted Mansion ride. Like, there's no place on Earth that is quite, you know, like that. And I think people get a skewed sense of what is the paranormal from, from shows like, like Ghost Adventures and, and others that seem to just go to a place and boom, they get all weird stuff going on. Is it all weird? I don't know. I don't think so, probably. But I, I don't necessarily think that they're, that they're not without merit, too, believe me. But uh, the ancient Ram Inn definitely looked like a weird, weird place. I don't know. It's just <laughs> very strange. And there was an old guy that was living there back then. I'm sure most of you guys, if you're familiar with, with Ghost Adventures, you know the, the episode I'm talking about. But, yeah, that's pretty wild. Pretty wild stuff. But let's see what it says. Having lived there almost all of her life, Humphrey certainly has a few stories to tell about it. Her father, who bought the building in the 1960s, had reportedly discovered a number of strange artifacts in its walls, including a pile of bones that were thought to be human, as well as a number of curious daggers, which experts so far have been unable to date. In addition, a 500-year-old mummified cat was found, bricked up in one of the walls, something that the building's previous occupants had put there to help ward off witches and evil spirits. Yeah, that's an old practice. The house is even thought to be built on the site of an ancient pagan burial ground. According to the deeds of the house, there is, could even be hidden cellars underneath the ground floor that have yet to be uncovered. If true, then who knows what could be waiting down there. When Humphrey's parents first brought the property, their intention was to turn it into a bed and breakfast, but <laughs> nowadays it serves as a popular destination for paranormal investigators. No doubt there's still much to be discovered about the building and its long enigmatic past well that's kind of neat they've opened it up to investigators um i think that's pretty cool but yeah this is it's a creepy building i guess we could look at it a little bit um you can tell that thing's been around for a long time and i think that thing was built in like the 1500s or even maybe older i don't know just a strange like way old uh, building but <laughs> i mean look at that building that is just crazy yeah, those, you know, those are hands that built that hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And it's still standing. That's, I guess, most impressive. I don't know if any of our current architecture will last anywhere near that long, but they definitely uh, built things to last back then. Look at how thick that wall is, too. That's pretty crazy. Look at that. Eesh. Creepy. Let's go see what's going on. This is a six-minute video. I guess they're just taking time to go go through the place, talk about the experiences and such. But it is a really weird little house. Um, the other thing you'll notice, and, and I don't know, I, obviously we have most of our, I think most of the viewers of the show are in, in America here. But when you go over to like England, um, I went over in 
2006, I guess, and visited a friend over there in Reading. And I was surprised at how narrow everything was and how, how short the ceilings are and how small things are. Like, they may have a, a you know, three-bedroom house, but it would be like, the bedrooms are really small. The hallways are small. The stairways are small. And, and I was in a few houses over there, and I was taken aback by that. And the roads are much closer together. Like, you over here in the U.S., you got these really wide roads. But, man, over there, they're threading the needle, like, all the time. It's really crazy. Um, beautiful. It was really an amazing journey, and I hope to go back there someday. But I want to see a lot of places, like Australia, and I want to see New Zealand. I want to see uh, uh, more of Asia and, uh, you know, the... I want to see a whole bunch of places. I think that'd be fun. Like ancient Greece, the Roman Parthenon and all that. That'd be great. But anyway, the old, the old stuff is still standing, folks. And that, to me, is the most amazing thing. I guess the ancient Romans and, and the ancient world had a, a recipe for concrete that is still better than anything we can make today. Like, you know, like the roads built in ancient Roman times are still used to this day. And, and yet we, <laughs> we can hardly keep a road good for a season or two around here. So I don't know, man. They, they built things for real back then. That's incredible. Just incredible stuff. But let's continue on. I still got the unboxing to come up next, and that's our good friend Nessie sent me some love from Australia or uh, New Zealand, so we'll see what she sent. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to find in that box. I don't know what's going to be happening, but... You'll be seeing it with me. And again, I had not peeked. I did not peek. I didn't peek in that package. I don't know what's in there. Um, but something's in there, and uh, this ought to be good. No, she's brilliant. She really is awesome. She does a hell of a job crafting things. All right, next up, uh, what is this? Oh, yeah, this one's kind of a, a another anomaly that was filmed in North Carolina. Uh, and this was from February 1st, so it's pretty new. One that I don't think we've covered here on the show yet, so let's get to this. Unexplained-mysteries.com. Mysterious red trails captured on camera in North Carolina. Oh, this does look familiar. We might have talked about this before, but let's talk about it now. It says, uh, artist and photographer Wes Snyder captured a time-lapse recording of the trails while, while filming the night sky. The phenomenon, which has been filmed by a camera uh, overlooking the ocean pursuit pursuit. Ocean Pursuit Shipwreck at Nags Head appears to be a series of red circular patterns in the sky to the right of the frame. Yeah, I think we did talk about this one. The footage shows a number of regular aircraft trails for comparison. Each individual image recorded on time-lapse and 10-second exposure with, and with approximately one second between them. I've caught thousands of plane trails and never have any of them look like this, so I'm certain they are not your typical aircraft, Snyder told McCarthy News. I've caught these trails before and several other time lapses, but I have yet to figure out what kind of plane possibly these are has these capabilities. And I remember when we covered it the last time, I was like, well, is it a drone? Could it be a drone? Um, and, and I don't think that that's, that's un, unreasonable, honestly, especially in today's age. People are flying drones as much as they can because, I mean, honestly, they create the most amazing f uh, photography and, and video of of you know areas but yeah that that wouldn't surprise me much if it's if it's not a drone then it may very well be a ufo i don't know but if they're 10 second frames with one second in between i guess that might be these gaps here where there's like a gap right here and i don't know and there's somewhat of one here there's one here so maybe this is the 10 second path or this is one here that would show it looping around and coming back around i don't know very interesting whatever it is I can't pretend to know, but it's interesting stuff. And that's the stuff we love on the show here. Let's get to the next one. And this is from, oh, some object over Atlantic City. Interesting. Let's see what's going on over Atlantic City, shall we? From unexplained-mysteries.com, pilot left baffled by a, a mystery object over Atlantic City. The mysterious object which mirrored the, the pilot's movements was captured on camera. According to the Federal Aviation Administration report that was discovered by the war zone, the incident occurred on September 16, 2018, when a pilot who had been flying a Diamond DA-40 light aircraft over Atlantic City in New Jersey at 2,000 feet spotted a rather unusual object. 
Initially believing it to be a set of balloons. A lot of balloons tonight, folks. Just saying, keep your balloons in your houses. <laughs> they will scramble jets. <laughs> Just saying. I guess balloons are dangerous. The pilot slowed down but was surprised to discover that it seemed to be mirroring the plane's movements. One of his passengers recorded some footage which can be viewed below. The pilot described how the unidentified object had a V-shaped antenna with some sort of payload hanging at the bottom of it, possibly a camera rig of some kind. He stated that it had circled around the plane as if we were trying to record a video of it. Yeah, we did this one too. I'm sorry I got redundant on the news, but I remember this one. And I, I still have a hard time believing that any kind of drone or camera rig like that could fly at a speed that would match uh, actually a, an actual plane. I don't think that they fly that fast enough to circle it and take photos of it. Um, and if they did, that would be absolutely reckless and stupid because, you know, you don't want your drone driving into somebody's prop and killing their plane and then killing them. So, um, yeah, we had actually covered that one before. So I don't know what it is. Uh, there is some footage here. Let's, let's do it. Jeez. Oh, yeah, I remember this. I'm looking for the object. Where the hell is it? Oh, there it is. There it is. It's right there. That's moving too fast to be a drone, though. I really don't think that's a drone. That's moving way too fast. Yeah, I don't buy that's a drone. Um, again, I could be absolutely wrong because I don't own a drone. I've never flown one. I, I've seen them, but there it is again. I guess it could be. It could be a, a, an RC type of plane. They make those RC jets that can just cruise. So I don't know what it is, but that's what they caught, that little anomaly there. Is it a UFO? Well, yeah, it is by definition. They don't know what the hell it is. Must be a UFO. This one's uh, from the way back here a little bit. This is from 2021, but it was one I'd never seen before. Um, no, wait. No, we did cover this one too. Never mind. I'm skipping that one. Uh, this one is old, though. This one's from, from a long ago, from 2014. Uh, there's a few stories in, in more current uh, news where children have wandered into forests and, and somehow made it. Uh, they've been some, in some cases, there was a little boy that was lost that was, in his terms, in his three-year-old vocabulary, he met a bear that took care of him and kept him warm and found him berries and stuff and then brought him back to buy his, his uh, grandmother's property or something like that. And it, it was huge news. I don't believe it was a bear. I believe that it was probably some kind of Sasquatch or something that had taken care of this little boy. But um, in any case, uh, amen, what a beautiful story. You know, I, I don't think any parent could ask for a better ending than that if you're faced with such an incredible horror. As a parent, I can't tell you what it would make me do to find out something happened to my child and, and not know what happened to my child. I, I would, I, I don't know. I would just, it would make you crazy, absolutely crazy. And how parents, you know, can, can ever get through something like that. I mean, no matter what happens, just get through the moments of that, knowing their child is somewhere, could be somewhere, and, and not able to get help. I mean, what a terrifying thing. Um, so, my, you know, my hat's off to anybody that has uh, the fortitude to get through something like that. I don't know how they do it. They are stronger people than I, for sure. But there, there, there are stories uh, and more. I've heard stories in the past of Bigfoots. Uh, there's one story of a little boy, like a two-year-old boy that was camping with his family up in the mountains somewhere, and I don't remember the location anymore. But the meat of the story is that this kid wandered off from camp, ended out in the woods, and got lost. And he didn't know what to do. He sat there. So all he did was just squat down and started crying. He was lost and afraid. And it was getting dark. He didn't know what to do. Um, the story goes, the little boy felt this hand, looked up, and there was a big hairy thing offering to take his hand. And the little boy reaches up, grabs the hand. And uh, allegedly this hairy being, whatever the hell it is, uh, wanders through the woods with this little boy and brings him back to the edge of his camp, stops in the thick part, and encourages the boy to continue walking back to his family, which he did, ran away back to his family who were overjoyed to see him, you know, tears, happiness, whatever. But is this a case of a Bigfoot interceding and, and, and 
being a guardian to this little child, this little helpless child, and bringing them home. We've certainly heard enough of the stories of cannibalistic Bigfoot and how they would steal away women and you know and and uh, women from tribes and in the First Nations and cannibal you know cannibalize them or whatever. Um, but it's great to hear stories like that, that maybe they are a beautiful you know wonderful thing too. I don't know, and maybe it's just as varied as people. You know, there's the the argument is 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 are the Bigfoot much so much like us that there's that much degree of of barometer on their personalities like there are some that would bend over backwards to help you and there are others that would just as soon pound you into into mud you know and perhaps that's the case but thank god the good ones found these kids but here's a story of a four-year-old that survived 11 days lost in a forest never does get into what happened to the child uh i don't know if the child couldn't speak or wasn't old enough yet or whatever but let's check out the story uh, again, from unexplained-mysteries.com, four-year-old survives 11 days lost in the forest. This is from 2014, August 14th of 2014. It says, a little girl somehow survived almost two weeks alone in a remote bear-infested forest in Siberia. Karina Chiktova, who had been on her way up to visit her father in Russia's northeast Saka region, when having discovered that they had gone out into the forest to fight a wildfire, she decided to wander into the woods to find him with nothing but her pet dog for company. The alarm was soon raised that she didn't come back and search parties were organized in an effort to find her. Rescuers were forced to restrict their searches and could only venture out in the presence of special forces due to the abundance of bears. Incredibly, the girl was found a full 11 days later, very much alive but somewhat emaciated. Her whereabouts were discovered after her dog had turned up at a local village, providing rescue teams the opportunity to follow its trail back to her location, approximately four miles away. It's simply incredible that she was found safe with so much wildlife in the forest, said a spokesman. It is believed that the four-year-old survived by eating berries and drinking from streams while her dog kept her warm at night and scared away predators while she slept. Aww, well... That's a great dog. That's <laughs> that's amazing. But it's you know it's an old story, but still, it, it, uh, in this case, there's no other mention of of any creature or whatever. And, and it doesn't sound like she was so little that she couldn't have talked. But apparently, she never did. I don't know. Maybe she didn't have the ability to talk. I don't know why why that is. But anyway, this has been a presentation of the Paranormal Portal News. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let's get back to the rest of the show. <laughs> Right. we went through the news finally sorry about that guys uh i had too much news pulled up but i guess i could <laughs> was able to breeze through a couple of those articles just because i'd covered them before but we've already burned up an hour of tonight wow how you guys doing all right so i promised you guys an unboxing tonight and by god that's exactly what i'm gonna do so we're gonna unbox i want to do some shout outs here so we can see who's here so if you want a shout out please take this moment and type something in chat because when you type, it populates the participants list, and I can give you a shout-out. If not, I don't know you're there. So, by all means, say hello. So, let's see who's here. I'm frazzled. Maggie, you're frazzled. Don't be frazzled, Maggie. I wonder if Nessie's here. Is Nessie here? I don't know. We'll find out. Let me look at the participants, and we'll see who is here. Well, there's not many people talking yet. It's only Brown Dwarf, Elaine Clifford, Jessica Mink, Maggie M10. Oh, now here they come. Rachel's here. R Richard Elmore. Oh, somebody's popped up. Brown Dwarf. Oh, Elise Goff is here. Good to see you, Elise. Thank you for coming in. Um, cosmic Man Person. <laughs> I love that name. That's awesome. Thanks for coming in. Malia Grimm is here. How you doing, Malia? uh let's see rachel richard elmore R ruger ridge sugar bridges the pharmacy is here uh the raven's outpost how you doing lee good to see you brother great to see you and the fourth color is here and someone else just popped in i'm looking brown dwarf who did i miss patty b how you doing patty b good to see you as well thanks for coming in and being a part of our journey tonight so all right I love a good unboxing. I think unboxing videos are fun, and they're they're very interesting to watch. Uh, you know, I mean, 
it's it's kind of a voyeuristic thing, I guess. But let's look at the stuff that I didn't get. <laughs> All right, I'm reaching. Ah. There, my headphone went dead for a second as well. All right, so here is the package, ladies and gentlemen. That made it all the way from New Zealand. You can see all the care and love this package received on its journey. Obviously, was handled nothing but short of professional. No, I think they punted it and kicked it and all kinds of crazy stuff happened. But this is from our good, good friend Nessie. Uh, and like I said, I have not peeked. I have not opened this. I don't know what's in it, but we're going to find out together. Now, again, Nessie has done some crafting for us. She's made some, the uh, again, the figure that's right up there on top of the lit paranormal portal sign I'm pointing to. That's my figurine. And Don got one, too, and it just about busted me in half. It made me so, so it was so hilarious because she did such a great job. They were so fun and amazing. But, all right, let's see what's in here. So she always, it's always amazing to get her packages, but let's see what she says. All right, dear Brent and Don, um, well, I'm opening this in Don's behalf as well. I thought your studio was missing a little bit of something, something. So I made you one. <laughs> no video this time. Big loves to my par paranormal mates, Nessie Monster. Thank you, Nessie. I don't know what you <laughs> sent, but whatever it is my studio needs. Ooh. All right, there's bubble wrap. What the hell's in here? Is it food? Does my studio need food? <laughs> I don't know if it would still be good from New Zealand, but I'm sure it would be. Um, but no, it's not food, I don't think. Let's see what it is. I am still breaking tape here, folks. There's masking tape on here. But she was an extraordinarily talented and creative person, so it, all, of her, all of her things are awesome. All right, let me see if I got this. Let's see what we got. <clears throat> all right there's quite a bit of bubble wrap which is good because you saw the state of that box so this is the box that was pummeled and beaten to oblivion all right let me put that over there still trying to get the bubble wrap open here so we can see what we got what the hell is this <laughs> uh <laughs> Oh my god, it's a shrunken head. <laughs> I oh, that is so perfect. <laughs> that's hilarious. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I got a shrunken head, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. She's right. This is the one thing my studio did not have, and now it needs, and it will definitely live here on the studio walls into eternity. Well, at least as long as there's a studio. But even if there's no studio, this will be living in my, in my uh, possession. That is really cool. Let me hold it up really close. God, that's, it's cool and creepy at the same time. Look at that thing. It's even got like taped, taped and stitched mouth. And, and uh, stitched eyes. <laughs> it's so creepy. That is awesome. Looks like it should have a YouTube show of its own. <laughs> hey, how y'all doing? <laughs> I could get a stick in it and do a show. Oh, that is awesome. Thank you, Nessie. That is brilliant. Wow. Very cool. Where should he go? Whew. I don't know. I'm going to have to find the perfect home for the for the shrunken head, but for now, he's going to be on the mic. He'll be on the mic stand keeping an eye on things. So there it is. He's right here, folks. The new head of Paranormal Production. Yeah, yeah. well, there's my producer right there. I finally got a producer. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you so much, Nessie. I hope you're here seeing that, if not. If not, then uh, God bless you. We love you. Thank you so much. That is the coolest thing ever. Wow. I have masks back here. This one right above my head was 
sent by Ruthie, our, our dear friend Ruthie Castro. And uh, that one up there is from Indonesia. And so this there is a head thing going on. There's an alien head right behind me here with the blue eyes. You can kind of see them peeking around my chair and are gray. Um, so, yeah, it'll fit in perfectly. There's a coconut head down behind me. I just didn't have anywhere to hang it where you could see it. But there's definitely a lot of heads in this production. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It takes a lot of heads to make the paranormal portal good. Thank you. I can do this all night. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. That's really cool. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, I got to think of a name. That is really wild. I don't even know what it's made out of, but it's very light. It's almost like a mache or something. That is so cool. Little shrunken head. I don't know if that's if that's what they did, they did they do that in, in the, the Maori people in in New Zealand do that? I don't know. Oof, that's awesome. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, the unboxing tonight here on the Paranormal Portal. I think it's awesome. It's awesome. I think somewhere in my shed I have a shrunken head kit. Use an apple and make an old shrunken head. It's got to be 50 years old by now. Wow. That's kind of cool, too, Elise. Thanks for sharing that. That'd be kind of fun just to make, you know, take some apples and do that. I remember those, too. I remember those kits that that kids could get, and, and you'd just take an apple, and you make certain slits and stuff. Yeah, there's your IT person. <laughs> yeah, that's about as smart as most IT people. I used to work in IT, so I, I can say that. I, I did all kinds of networking and, and user support. But anyway, don't let it go to my head. <laughs> I won't. It'll go to his head instead. Uh, I think it's a him. Is it a him? <laughs> it kind of looks familiar. <laughs> oh, that's funny. You should have a goatee and a bandana. It'd be about perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, let's continue on here, and we'll see what else we can get into in this course of our journey tonight. Um Let's see. Oh, yeah, here we go. I told you guys we we're going to get into more trucking stories, and by God, I meant it. I always I always mean what I say. I don't always follow through as well as I'd like, but I always mean it. Yes, she forgot to tell you. Uh, what? It was the last. Got to piss her off. Said, I don't know what that means. Okay. I'm not sure if that was for me, but anyway. Paranormal portal, don't let it go to your head. Nope, I won't. Um, oh, wow. Went to Maggie says, I went to Ripley's at 2 a.m. in London 10 years ago, and it was so good. I love, I love the Ripley's museums. I've been to the one in New York, and that was really cool. It was years and years ago, back in like 86 or, you know, eight, like 89, 88, 89, somewhere in there. Long time ago. But it was a really cool time. Went to some some broad Broadway shows. Saw Les Miserables on Broadway out there. That was really cool. It was a long show, though. Oof. But anyway, let's get to our show. Um, we're going to get into the trucker, st trucker stories now. And this is an article we've been burning through for a while. But we're going to continue right now. I think we're going to continue right now. Hold on. I think i got to clear stuff off here or no? Let me see. Oh, yeah, it doesn't work that well. There we go. Got it up here. I can close that for right now. There we go. Okay, so we're going to go through this article from roughmaps.com, and it's Trucker's Creepiest Stories. And I, we've been going through this one for a while. Some really incredible stories that have been covered on here. Um, some real strange ones. They're, they're very short for the most part, but uh, profound nonetheless. Uh, again, most paranormal uh, occurrences are really only a few seconds long. I mean, it's much like most Bigfoot sightings are only a few seconds long. It's like, I don't know, if you're not paying attention, you'll miss them. You know, and perhaps perhaps we miss a lot of paranormal experiences and, and encounters just because we're not paying attention. You know, imagine if we were always paying attention to the kind of stuff we would catch. But let's see what this says. It says, Jesus, take the wheel. Number 22 is the one we're on. And it says, my father was a truck driver, and he was driving through a smaller town in Northern California hauling tomatoes. Well, suddenly he got incredibly tired. He wasn't low on sleep or deprived at all, but he ended up passing out at the wheel. Oh, my God. Last thing he saw was the light of the town in front of him. 
He woke up about two hours later on the other side of town, perfectly parked on the side of the road. He swears something was looking out for him that night. Yeah, no doubt. That's incredible that you would fall asleep for two hours and wake up in your park just fine. I would, I, I got to tell you, if I woke up two hours after falling asleep at the wheel, the first thing I would do is go, oh my God, it's been two hours and probably poop myself. You know, I mean, honest to God, it's like you, yeah, the, the reality of that hits you. I've fallen asleep for like a, a fraction of a second and just about had a heart attack just because it was just so intensely panicky, you know, but for two hours, what the hell was going on? And, and somebody, something or somebody or something was obviously driving that truck for him. Yeesh, my, uh, it's, that was by Ton, Ton Inc. T-O-N-N-I-N-C. Okay. All right. Well, that's a, an amazing story. Here's number 23. An unseen presence. Reno, Nevada. A place on the north side of town way off the freeway towards an old military road. I got up there like at 1 a.m., and the place I was going to didn't open until 6 a.m. The facility was closed, so no one was around, and I just pulled into the lot and parked off to the side and went to sleep and was woken up shortly after to someone knocking on the door. It was so forceful that the truck shook. I jump out of bed thinking that they are, they are there already and want to offload me early. I get to the door, and no one is there. So I step down, thinking they're behind the trailer. No one around. I look around the truck, and, and, and absolutely no one. No wind, no bad weather, not another person around. I jump in the truck and pull out of there as fast as I could and went and parked in a nearby truck stop. I still can't explain it. I mean, I guess I can justify it. I could have just imagined the sound, but the truck shaking was definitely real. Ugh. That's horrible. That was by Paul the Kid, 10-4. 10-4, good buddy. Oh, that's, that's terrible. <clears throat> no, excuse me. I didn't mean to cough like that right into your ears. Those of you wearing earbuds, I do apologize. That was my mistake. Number 24, The Sixth Sense. It was a good movie. My uncle said he hired a guy from town to help him drive late shifts at night with him on the road. The story was kind of was the guy had somehow managed to burn down a house as a kid and has since claimed to see the dead. He would occasionally swerve on the roads at nothing. Or worse, my uncle said he would be sitting around and the guy would say, I see a little girl on the swing. My aunt confirmed it and said the guy would say things like that often. Apparently, he learned how to live with it. Jeez. Skate or fi instead of skate or die, 444. That's a weird one. What would it be like if that was what your life was like? Would you share it? Would you let people know you saw these things all the time and just let other people deal with it? Like, I don't care. I'm just going to tell people. <laughs> I think most often people that have the, those abilities to see like that, they keep it to themselves and, and they, they kind of live isolated because of it. Because, I mean, you're you're not normal and that's not a bad thing. It's just... You, it, the normal is just that you can't see those kind of things. But if you see that and have to deal with it, I imagine that's that's got to be a pretty heavy weight to have to haul around. So maybe this guy's doing it right. Maybe he's like, yeah, I'm just going to say it, and people can do with it what they want. It's kind of kind of commendable, actually. All right, so that was Skater Phi, 444. Number 25, The Truth is Out There. That's an X-Files line. I used to love the X-Files. A few years back, I was driving home after a shift. It was 3 or 4 a.m., and I was tired but not exhausted. It's a deserted state route in the middle of nowhere, and it's pretty common not to see a single car during the 30-mile trip. I drive this road multiple times a week, and it's mostly open fields and some farmland through this 30-mile stretch. This particular night, it was cold, but the sky was clear, like no clouds or anything, and I actually love nights like this because... You can see the stars so well without light pollution. Anyway, about halfway back home, I come over this hill to a two or three mile straight stretch. A huge dark object about the length of a pickup truck, but far rounder and thicker catches my attention. It's just hovering about 50 feet in the air over a farm field. There's a very bright red light coming out of the, the side or bottom 
I couldn't tell exactly where it originated from because it was so bright. As I was going about 50 miles per hour past it, I had only a few seconds to look at it, but the images burned into my mind and I have no idea what it was. I wanted to turn around, but I was freaked out. I'm sure alien life exists somewhere, but as for visiting our planet, I don't know. But if I ever had to paint a picture of what I think a UFO would look like, I'd paint whatever the heck I saw that night. I haven't seen anything, anything odd over that area since that night, but that was odd enough for a lifetime. <laughs> That's by Bosch Bosch 92. That's creepy stuff, man. Um, yeah, I, I guess it sounds, sounds like a, a very real experience. You got to wonder, what are they doing? What are they doing when they're just over a farm field? That's, what, what are you looking at? Maybe at him. You know, maybe he's what they were doing. They were just checking him out. Number 26, the field of nightmares. I parked off an exit ramp at 3 a.m. The moon was full and high, and I spotted an unmistakably human figure in a nearby cut cornfield. A little spooky, but I just wrote it off as an old timer putting out a scarecrow for the grandkids. I started watching a few YouTube videos before turning in, and out of the corner of my vision... I thought I saw movement. I shut my lights off to get a good look and saw the figure, but nothing else. I couldn't be sure, but it looked like maybe it was in a different spot. Maybe a little closer, even. I was definitely feeling a bit spooked. The highway was devoid of anyone besides a car passing every 10 minutes or so. I didn't want to, but I had to jump out and go to the bathroom. I considered a bottle, but I told myself I was being childish, and I took out look at the figure, and it was right where I figured it should be. I hop out, walk between the truck and the trailer, and start going. Every fiber in my being wanted to look. I told myself again I was being foolish, but I couldn't help it. I looked out, the field was empty, and the figure wasn't there. My stomach dropped. I finished up and jumped back in. I took off down the highway, stopped 40 minutes up the road at a well-lit and very full store. I haven't stopped on a ramp since. Yeah, that's weird. I mean, it's just a figure, right? It could have been could have been any number of things, but it could also be any number of things. You know, <laughs> there's the there's the good things and then there's the not so good things. So, if you don't know, you don't know. That's creepy. That was by A can no number 10, I guess. A can A K A A C A N N O 10. Number 27, Lord of the Flies. That was a creepy movie. My uncle was driving between Great Falls and Helena at around 3 a.m. He had his high beams on, and it was a lonely drive and a quiet highway. In the distance, he saw something cross the median and start to slow his approach, thinking it was a deer. But as he got closer, he realized it was standing up and slowed down to about 30 miles per hour. Then he realized what it was and started to panic. It was a man in blue coveralls with a pig's head, not a mask, but literally the head of a pig on his shoulder. My uncle moved to the left lane as he passed. Pig head lunged at the truck. My uncle didn't stop and check if he'd grabbed on, but he was in the safety of Helena and nothing was out of the ordinary there. But on that stretch of road now, he doesn't slow down for anything. That was wider than longer. <laughs> it was a pig-headed guy. You got to wonder, what the hell is wrong with some people? <laughs> At what point does that get to be a good idea? Like, you know, I don't know what should I do tonight. I feel bored. I know. I'm going to put on a pig head and go and lunge at trucks. That sounds like a great time. That is so weird. I mean, that should never get to be on your list of of things to do. <laughs> if you find yourself entertaining that thought, it's probably time for some therapy. It's got to be therapy time. That is just so wrong. Oh my God. Ooh. I wonder if it has ears. Maybe it had ears. I don't know. It sounds like the whole, the whole pig head, like he just carved out a pig head and, and put his head in it or something. What if it was a pig headed cryptid man? I don't know. I haven't heard of those before, but then again, there's the average, every, I'd say about every week I run into something about the paranormal I hadn't heard of before. So 
It wouldn't surprise me if there's pig men around. They are they are certainly on Star Wars. Gamorrean guards, right? Book book of uh, book of Boba Fett. Eef. Number twenty eight, the Bad Samaritan. Driving home through the outskirts of town, a young woman ran through the street, waving at me and yelling something. She was wearing nothing but a t-shirt and underwear, and there were lots of homeless people in that area, so I just kept going. It's fairly common for women to flag a car down and distract them while a bunch of guys scramble out of the bushes to take your car. Well, about a mile down the road, I realized she didn't really look homeless, and I felt guilty for not stopping. And the ethical thing to do was to risk a carjacking for the possibility the woman was in danger. Bad people shouldn't turn everyone else into bad people with fears, but... When I went back, the woman was totally gone. I'd only passed one car when I flipped around, a blue 99, 99S Toyota, and there were no stores or houses. Just sand, dirt, rocks, brush, and later that night, it occurred to me that she may have been running from the man in the blue Toyota. I hope, I hope she was a carjacker. Yeah, that's creepy. <sighs> Those are the kind of stories you just don't ever need to hear. And it's not, I, I mean, I don't... I don't not recognize those things are a part of our world. I just, I just don't know. I mean, it's, there's such a state of broken that there's some things that doesn't really behoove you to discuss because what are you going to do? It just, all you can do is just acknowledge the broken, I guess. It's a, it's a sad, tragic world sometimes. It's also a beautiful world. So I try to stay focused on the good part. Number 29, the silent watcher. I used to have this regular delivery place that was out in the boondocks, miles away from civilization, and smack dab in the middle of two large towns. I would drive this route maybe once a month and would always pass at least one car driving towards me due to the sheer length of the drive. There was a small group of old houses on this route that were really broken down. I had never seen anyone around them in the six months of driving the route, and Always assumed they were vacant because they didn't look livable. Well, I was driving out to this customer one autumn afternoon. I'd been driving for a very long time without seeing a single car drive towards me. Finally, I drive past the abandoned houses, and there's one old lady in her front yard pushing an old manual grass cutter. She stops in her tracks as I drive towards her. I took it as a sign I was speeding or something and slowed down, and I take a quick glance at my rearview mirror after passing by, and she was just staring straight at me. She dropped the grass cutter and turned 180 degrees to do this. It was just very odd and definitely set off my spidey sense. Never saw her again, or anyone else on that route by those houses in the 10 months I drove by. Yeah. Then again, you know, okay, so here's the deal with... with haunted places most places are not haunted to the degree that there's always activity a lot of times activity is is can be seasonal and i'm not sure why i don't know if it's an anniversary of some event that that's where the energy pops up um or if there's just certain circumstances and certain times of the year that make that easier like the of course the thinning of the veil is very common in the in the October month towards uh, Soween, and maybe that makes it easier for spirits to make themselves known. And I don't know if this old woman was a spirit, but if the houses were in as tough shape as this person is saying, then probably nobody was living there, but they had never seen anyone else there either, but then this one day they did. And so was that just a circumstance where through the course of, of time, they happened to hit it right just that one time, to be the right conditions to have that that experience. And I think that that's the case. I mean, I lived in, in several active houses, and a lot of the times they're quiet. But every once in a while, things just pop off. And it, and it may not even be seasonally. Although I, I, I have noticed that seasonally, there are certain seasons, and it's not any one specific season. There's just a certain season, given a certain house, how, we'll have a certain season where more things happen than the others. And, and so again, it could happen any time and you don't necessarily know why or when or what's going to go on. But, but I, I just don't think many places are actively haunted all the time. There may be a presence there all the time, but you know, that doesn't mean there's going to be plates flying and door slamming every night of the, of, of the year. That's just not common at all. 
And a lot of times you hear people, well, we moved in and for the first several months it was wonderful. We love this house. And then, boom. So is, is that just the time when things ha hop off in that house? Maybe. It's hard to say. It's a very curious thing. Uh, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, Maggie. <laughs> no pig heads, man. Pig headed men, perhaps. Yeah, there's plenty of those. Okay. I can be one of those plenty of times. <laughs> Keep nogging off. What do you mean, Ruger? You're not nogging off, are you? Just wake up, dude. What do you need? Do you want me to juggle? What's going on here? <laughs> Unless nogging off means something else. I, I assume it means you're falling asleep. I'm trying. These jokes are getting worse. I know. Just go with it. What jokes? Are, what's going on? Are you guys talking? In, uh, <laughs> are you talking about my, my dialogue here? Or are you talking about something going on in chat? Now I got to know. I got to look at the chat and see what's been going on. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't get paid for my humor. <laughs> uh, but I assume you guys are talking about something in the chat. All right, here we go. Let's go to the next one. Oh, dear. This was a trash route on a pretty rural area, and we were at a stop loading trash when a pickup struck. A tr a pickup struck? A pickup stopped behind us. A petite woman in scrubs that were covered in blood got out and asked directions to Lake Jack Nolan. She said there was a deer that had been hit by a truck and she had been sent to remove the remains. She never said who sent her, but she wasn't moving a deer anywhere at her size. Still, we gave her directions and sent her on the way, and we all said we wondered if she was going up there to dump a body or something like that. She was already covered in blood in a nice truck and was supposed to be on her way to remove roadkill, that was far too heavy for her to handle. It really disturbed me at the time, and I still think about it. That was by Pedizel. Pedizel? Okay. I don't know. You know, women can surprise you, especially, you know, uh, there's women are incredibly strong. I'm always amazed, you know, you, and, and everybody's seen this, but I, as a man, I'm still amazed by this. But you ever see the, those those mothers? They're, they're out there alone. They got... They got like a 40-pound kid in their arms and one arm, and they got a whole like fistful of groceries in the other, and they're just powering. <laughs> they're just going. It's like, how do you do that? I, I, I'm impressed by that. Those mommy muscles are no joke, man. They get tough. That's incredible. I don't know how they can do it, but, man, there's a lot of, there's a lot of power packed into those arms. Those mommy muscles, I'm telling you. Oh, thank you, Maggie. That's really sweet. Because you're on your own. Great show. We're, we're, we're doing really bad shrunken head puns. And your shrunken head needs a name. <laughs> I tell you what. Yeah, if you guys come up with a name, get onto the social media at, at Paranormal Portal Radio on Facebook. And uh, if you come up for the name of, the, of, this, of this head, We'll definitely give it its official name if you guys come to some consensus, like this is the name. Then we'll do that. <laughs> he doesn't need a name, though. You're right. I assume he It's uh, doesn't look like a woman. It looks like a guy. <laughs> it's really cool. All right. So the sunken head name, that's the new the new thing. Uh, I'll start a thread on the on the on the paranormal. I'll do it right now, as a matter of fact, just while I'm while I'm thinking of it. Uh, let's see. What should I say here? Just unboxed, unboxed a, a package from our good friend Nessie in New Zealand. New Zealand. It's a shrunken head. <laughs> so, now... I am tasking you all, tasking you all to come up with a name. Most likes on comment wins. Okay, it's posted on the Paranormal Portal Radio Facebook page. So if you want to become, uh, want to want to potentially name 
I'll put it on the, no, I won't put it on the fans. I'll just put it on the paranormal portal. Cause if I, if I got too many posts, it's going to be hard to track. So it's just on the uh, facebook.com slash paranormal portal radio. If you want to submit a name for consideration for the shrunken head, then by all means head over to the Facebook page, drop your suggestion. And the, the suggestion with the most likes will officially get the, the pleasure of naming this, this fine head. <laughs> so there you go. All right. Okay, so Beasts Among Us is next. 31. Let's see. We're going to get to some other stuff here, too. I want to get to a couple of reports from Phantoms and Monsters, but we're going to get these Beasts Among Us. Uh, this one is to be the last of the weird trucker stories for tonight. Uh, I used to drive a truck in northern Manitoba, Canada, and you can drive for several hours and see very few vehicles. This road is quite flat and straight in stretches. Of course, this is deep in the bush. One day I saw something cross the road in the distance, very large, easily past the hood of my truck, but not long like a moose or an elk, just tall. It disappeared into the bush, as I, and as I drove by the spot, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I heard days later a tow truck driver describing on the radio his encounter with a similar creature, only he was much more clear that he had spotted Bigfoot. This guy went to some length to explain he didn't want people thinking he was crazy, but he was sure what he saw. I asked an Aboriginal client of mine in a nearby community, and he said the elders spoke of them as commonly as they spoke of the other animals. I didn't know what I saw that day, but I'm certain it wasn't a bear, moose, deer, or elk. I just don't know what the heck it was. Yeah, probably saw yourself a squatch. That was by the hot bread guy. The hot bread guy. Is that what his delivery was, hot bread? That's pretty cool. Okay. Well, that does it for our stories from the from the long haul. Stories from the long stretch. And let's get on to a couple of stories here from phantomsandmonsters.com. And the first one. Again, if you're not familiar with phantomsandmonsters.com, get familiar with it. It's a great site. Lon Strickler, of course, is the is the founder and 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 uh, he he uh, he posts a lot of content over there, and and he also has research teams and such. But it's a great repository for paranormal claims. He does a lot of recording of those and and cataloging them. Uh, it's kind of like the BFRO except for all of the paranormal, and he does a great job over there. So check out phantomsandmonsters.com, and you can also check out Lon's podcast, which is Phantoms and Monsters Radio. So. Check out all those things, and uh, of course, go into Phantoms and Monsters. You can find links to all of Lon's projects and his books and stuff, so definitely support what he's doing over there. But here's the first article from Phantoms and Monsters, and uh, this one is pretty good. I just want to see what I got on the screen here, because I always have a lot of stuff here. Okay, there we go. Yep, here's the first one, and this is... Um, Terrifying Ouija board session traumatizes a young teen. This is kind of interesting because on the Paranormal Portal fans page on Facebook, a person put a put a put a a, a picture of uh, what looks like a magazine rack that has a, a, a Ouija board imprint on on the bottom rack of it. Not like it's you know on the top or anything. You couldn't really use it. It's kind of underneath the magazine holder section. And it's a flat plate with the, the Ouija board imprint. And uh, there was a, there was a, you know, the person said, hey, I found this on a, on a rummage sale or a yard sale or a thrift sale or whatever. And I thought, oh, that's cool. What do you guys think? Should I buy it? And I was, I was pretty, uh, pretty pleased with the results. I mean, a few people shared their ideas and their thoughts on it. And no, no ideas are wrong. I don't mind, you know, and I don't have anything against people being careful about things like this because I think... They should be regarded carefully, but you know, I, I, I also think that there's the other side of it where people see a Ouija board and they just go, "Oh, evil!" You know, make the sign of the cross and and uh, hiss and <laughs> and all that. But I, I don't think that the board, it, the, the 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 design itself, is anything. I don't think it's anything um, because it only becomes um, it only becomes a portal or a gateway or or a, uh, esoteric tool when it's used 
And if it's never been used, it's, it's really not a dangerous thing. It's just a design at that point. So this is my opinion. And, I, you know, again, agree, don't agree, that's cool. I don't pretend to know, but this is just my thoughts. But, um, you know, in any esoteric practice where you make a, a tool of some kind, you have, there's a big process, not only in making the tool, but in, in attuning it to what you're doing. Like, um, you know, any, any crystals in, in uh, objects, wands, uh, uh, talismans, they're not just because they have a certain design imbued with this, you know, amazing power. It's, it's by attuning them to what you're doing that they become powerful. So the same, I think, is true for a Ouija board. But anyway, I, I know plenty of people have used Ouija boards and had them go really sideways, and I understand people's trepidation with that. Why mess with it? I agree. If you don't know what you're doing, don't mess with it. <clears throat> As a young team, or it says a young team at a family and friends get together, observes and experiences the evil that can manifest by use of a Ouija board. The incident is deeply etched in his memory. Hold on, I got a cough. There we are. Much better. Still clearing out after that illness. Eesh. And he says, I recently received the following account. When I was 13 years old or so, my aunt and uncle invited my family to their house. This is not a get-together for dinner or drinks, but to experiment with something they had never done before. A Ouija board. Hey, kids, let's get the Ouija board and talk to Grandma. Uh, so they never had done it before, so you know it's already off to a bad start. Because I will say I think it's important to set your stage to tune your environment and attune your environment and award your environments against, against the dark things. But this incident took place 21 years ago. The memory became much more prevalent than all the others in my life. So when someone mentions the Ouija board around me, it triggers one of the most traumatic memories of my childhood. I remember there being a full house of family and friends at around 20 or so People looking at my aunt and uncle along with one member of the family using the actual board. To the best of my recollection, that's who I remember. If there were other people using the board that day, I don't remember how it began or what activated the board, but whatever it was, they did get a response. Out of nowhere, something made contact with them. You could feel that there was a presence, a foreboding energy in the room. And they, they had to find out that the thing they made contact with claimed it was a boy. My uncle asked the boy what it wanted, and the planchette immediately spelled out, kill her. Jesus. Oof. My uncle asked, who did the boy want that to happen to? And the boy responded, your wife. My uncle replied, why? And the boy said, she's evil. Now, back in the day, my aunt was a tough, foul-mouthed woman who would stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody. Though the, the person she is now compared to the woman she was 21 years ago is night and day. Two completely different people. Needless to say, what this boy was wanting my uncle to do didn't sit well with my aunt as she began provoking and taunting whatever it was uh, that wanted her deceased. And my uncle, my aunt called, called let loose several profanities and said, you know, F-U-M-F and you're so f Give me, give me a, a effing sign. Well, it responded. As soon as she said that the house, the, she said that the house became totally quiet, with an eerie silence, and everyone present wanted to see if they would hear or see something out of the ordinary. Actually, it was the calm before the storm, as they say. Then, out of nowhere, loud scratching and digging sounds emanated from all parts of the house, as if it were things inside the walls trying to break through. You talk about fear, there wasn't a person in that house who didn't look shocked and scared. But my aunt, being, being herself, provoked it one more time. And that's when she said it again. If you're so real, give me an effing sign. The scratches intensified and the digging turned into hard knocks on the front door and it was so loud that the entire house seemed to shake. My cousin, her son, and I were the same age. We both went to answer the front door and when we opened it, there was nothing there. The scratching in the walls intensified. As soon as we shut the door and walked away, the intense knocking started all over again. Then a few seconds later, it suddenly stopped. 
My aunt was the only person present who wasn't as bothered by what had happened as compared to everyone else. I'd heard the rumors that my uncle burned the Ouija board, but days later, it manifested intact on the same table. He was then told he needed to break it in half first and then burn it. But who really knows what exactly happened with it? But this was my first experience with something paranormal or evil. Since then, I've, I've had an extreme curiosity with the paranormal and have had my own experiences with other things of this nature. I've been ghost hunting multiple times, experienced the Ouija board as an adult, but never stopped believing in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Some will say I'm tempting the devil, the paranormal, etc., but perhaps I have no fear. Hmm. That is interesting. Yeah, the one thing you don't do, I don't think it's ever good to do, is taunt a spirit, because you don't know what you're taunting. It could be uh, a little benign little spirit, or it could be a you know, full-fledged archdemon. You don't know. I mean, <laughs> you have no idea who you're talking to. We don't have that kind of vision. So I think it's always wise to keep it calm. Keep calm. All right, there's one more from Phantoms and Monsters I wanted to get through. And uh, this is more of a Bigfoot-like creature here. And this is uh, ape-like creature encounters continue in South America's forests. Uh, this is from February 17th, so it's very, very new. All right. And he says, two separate witnesses observed an unknown hairy ape-like creature while on the forested trails near Rosario de la Fontera, Salta, Argentina. For decades, the beast has been seen by local witnesses. Let me pull up the chat to make sure I'm not missing something. Just got to make sure. All right. So it says, in early 2011, two men training for the, the biathlon along the forested trails of Cerro Termal and, Gua and a guacho passing through the area on horseback encountered an unknown creature six kilometers east of Rosario de la Fontero, Fontera, Salta, Argentina. The strange hairy beast has been the cause of numerous reports in Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina since the late 1930s. Some people call it a Mapanguari. Others refer to it as the, the Curinguian. I think the Mapanguari is a big sloth, though, isn't it? i got to look this up. i got to look up. A, I think a Mapanguari is a uh, Mapanguari. There it is. It's a sloth. Maybe not. It's a curious creature, I guess. I don't know. Let me see the images. I'll pull it up on the images in Google here and put it on the screen, and you guys can see, because I think that's important going forward. But I think, yeah, they're like an enormous sloth-like creature but there's some that show more of a ape-like creature yeah i don't know i think truly the mapunguari is a is a sloth-like creature look at that it's got a, a mouth in its chest <laughs> i don't know what it is but at any rate there you have it that's a mapunguari so that's hardly the same thing as a bigfoot but maybe when when you look at it like this it's hard to get a real distinction I mean, could you be so clear-headed to go, no, that's, that's a giant sloth, not a Bigfoot? I mean, I wouldn't know. I would just be some big hairy thing coming towards me. <laughs> that's creepy. But I think, yeah, this is the legendary sloth monster of your nightmare. Okay. Well, that's a Mapunguari, just for the record. I wanted to pull that up so we could look at it. The Guacho, uh, sur surnamed Posadas, in charge of a farm owned by business, business, businessman Oscar Ferres, was crossing the high and densely forested sector of the early hours when he ran into a strange being standing over two meters tall, covered in, covered in hair from head to foot, long arms ending in sharp claws, and an oval-shaped head and an enormous mouth with menacing fangs. Posadas did not wish to make any statements, but the third parties to whom he retold his experience said, that the man, impressed by the sight, got off his mount and reached for the shotgun on his saddle, but the hominid had vanished by the time he looked up again. So that's not your typical sloth, then. Because <laughs> it would be like, I'm out of here. You know? <laughs> it wouldn't be gone in a blink. Um, that's a strange one. Okay. 
However, biathlete Humberto Sosa, 52, has won over 100 events in regional and provincial competitions, did not hesitate to make known his extraordinary experience. We were training with Susana Romano, 32, at around 1,700 hours. Upon reaching a curve, we felt the crushing of branches from the hill. We stopped to see what it could be, and amid the foliage, we saw it briefly. It was a large animal, some kind of ape, moving with great agility. Susanna and I exchanged glances as though to confirm if what we'd just seen excuse me, was a product of our imaginations or real. We remained still with our eyes riveted to the place where we'd seen it jump and became lost in the vegetation. We tried to listen, but everything remained silent. Suddenly, all the birds flew away as though fleeing from something, and once again with the same speed as before, it jumped. It was like a giant ape. We were scared and decided to run as quickly as possible toward the less forested area, and however, that thing seemed to follow us, running parallel to us some 10 meters down the slope. Though through the wilderness, which is impossible for a human to do given the thickness of the vegetation. Through the leaves and branches we could see its enormous silhouette and every so often could hear how timber was violently shattered, which led us to believe that the creature's weight was tremendous. Sosa, an electrician by trade, is a well-respected man in the city by virtue of his career, both as an individual and a sportsman. I have heard, I had heard and read people's stories about this beast, and I would laugh, and I'll admit to not believing anything that was said. What's more, I, was, I ascribed all these tales to uh, some sort of collective hysteria or psychosis. However, now I have no doubt that what people said was true, since I experienced that terror in person. It was evident that this critter was following us, and I therefore feared it would attack us. I felt fear for my companion and asked her to run as fast as she could. I told myself that in that situation, reached the brink, I'd give my life for her. We ran and ran, always feeling that the animal was running beside us in the dense woods. In a given area where the vegetation isn't quite so dense, and the possibility of observing was greater, we stopped to look around us, but the noise stopped, and the jumping shadow that had followed us had vanished. In that distance, we could see that the birds flocked together, as if frightened by something. Wow. <clears throat> Excuse me. So sad that he customarily trains in Cerro Thur Turmal in the company of a group of sportsmen. This time we were the only two, and it was our turn to undergo a traumatic experience. In my 30 years of covering these trails, I'd never seen anything like it. Wow. That's crazy. Hmm. So the Mopinguari, or is it an ape or a sloth? Or are these two very different creatures? I don't know. That's crazy, crazy stuff. Oof. Gives me the chills. Gives me the chills. Sorry. I'm a little scratchy. Voice still isn't 100%, but it's getting there. I'm still, like, <laughs> still coughing up stuff. Eesh. Whatever I had, I had a hell of a deal. But I'm getting better every day. More and more energy. All right, how are we doing here? Wow. <clears throat> I guess we got like about six minutes left. So let me close this so I don't uh, try to reread it on another show, which I do sometimes. I guess we can go to some of these more of these... Um, I was going to do some crop circle stuff, but I'm not going to do that yet. Where is it now? Jesus. Here we go. We can read a couple more of these. Um, from the truck stories. I think these are cool. Uh, Femme Fatale is number 32. And let me pull it up so you guys can see it. My father has told me this story maybe a thousand times. My family went on a trip from Mexico City to Acapulco when I was barely a year old. On the way back home in the middle of the night, the car broke down and a pat patrol car quickly came to our help. There were three officers in the car and the chief offered to take my dad to the nearest gas station. I think I've heard this one before, but let's see. The officer told him he could find a mechanic there and told the other two officers to stay with our car. My dad said they seemed absolutely not pleased with that order, 
until the chief told them, don't worry, there's a woman and two children. And that seemed to calm the two men, but it definitely gave my dad, a mom, a bit of, a bit of pause. Driving to the gas station in the car, my dad asked the chief what that was all about, and the chief told him that there had been many accidents in this part of the road, and all of the accidents involved young men traveling without any women or children. Those who survived were told a completely different eerie tale. They said they were crashed, that they crashed because they could see a very beautiful woman next to the road. However, once they came close to her, she turned out to be just a rotting corpse staring at them. And they crashed because they were paralyzed with fear. Yeah, that's the same one. That's a creepy story. That was by the peasant King M. But I don't know. I, I don't know. This is probably a repeat that he had found. Um, I don't know that he's the original source of it. Maybe he is. But that's a creepy story. I don't know. <laughs> you got to wonder about that psychology. It's like, I don't know. What should I do tonight? I'll, I'll look like a beautiful woman until they get close and then I'll get all creepy. Hey, I think they need better hobbies in the spirit world. <laughs> maybe that's hilarious, though. I don't know. It's hard to see. Hard to see it from our vantage point, but maybe that's hilarious to them. All right, let's go to the next one, and this is this is uh, a daring feat. A daring feat. Driving southbound on I-75 in the winter in Ohio, I witnessed a compact car like a Cobalt or something similar get on the on-ramp to merge into I-75 North, and then completely lose control. They went sideways, fell at least six feet off the ramp and under the shoulder off of the interstate, landing on all four wheels. Then they spun around 360 degrees and proceeded to <laughs> merge into traffic like it was nothing. Blew my mind. The CB radio was going nuts for about five minutes. Oh my God, who else saw that? Etc. <laughs> I think it'd probably be hilarious to, if you're going to be traveling over the road like that to bring a CB just to hear what those truckers talk about. I'll bet you uh, <laughs> maybe maybe CBs aren't that popular anymore. I don't know. I can't imagine. I think they would be. But that was by Ace of Spades 161. Number 34, The Night That Never Ends. Myself and two friends had to drive from Laredo, Texas to Baton Rouge, Louisiana one night in my Ford van. It was about 2 a.m., and there was a particularly long and dark section of highway just outside Laredo. No buildings, towns, or lights for about 50 miles. I was in the right lane coming up on a truck and pulled, and pulled out into the left passing lane. As I was slowly overtaking this long truck, my peripheral vision caught a sudden movement of this big truck towards the right shoulder. I saw the truck was swerving to avoid hitting a person dressed in all white with a white face, whose arms were folded across the chest and eyes were closed as they walked across the highway. I swerved to the left and barely missed this ghostly-looking person with my passenger mirror. I can still remember seeing that their eyelids were closed. That's how close we came to hitting this person. That was by Flash D-Man. That's a funny one because those kind of stories happen a lot. Um, there's There's... One story that we heard, which is apparently, uh, it was by some trucker, a trucker family. They were talking about a route they did, and they drove in three different trucks. The father and the two adult sons were all driving a truck. And they all came on this. There was in Texas. I think it was Texas. I'm pretty sure. But it started downpouring, and there was a storm, and they were still driving to get to where they were going, and they were going along, and all of a sudden the brakes of the first truck just get hammered and the, over the radio they're like wait slow down stop there's a there's a person there's a person i i can't stop and so they they apparently hit it well each consecutive truck saw this person standing there as it went through the truck so it's not like it just popped up after the truck and stood there it was like they saw it come through and and the the guy that talked to me he was like i saw it going through my truck like in like the head of it in my truck and then passing through as it was transparent. And apparently this area of road has that common occurrence where during rainy storms in a certain time of the year, this apparition appears and tries to freak people out. What a horrible thing. What a horrible, horrible thing. But, but this sounds like one of those, like, you know, this one has a closed 
cross-armed apparition just walking across the road. Absolutely nothing to fear, but, you know, it's like, what a bastard, you know? That is so creepy. I don't know, folks. I don't write this stuff. I just talk about it. But I do know that it's nine. It's time. It's time for the portal to end. Oh, well, at least this episode of it. But I hope you guys have had a good time. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Alice, thank you for being here. Gigi is here. How you doing, Gigi? Did you see the uh, unboxing, Gigi? Look what I got. <laughs> All right on. <laughs> so um, it's just fun. But remember, I just posted on social media a little bit ago about this little shrunken head that Nessie sent. What a cool, cool thing. And uh, if you want to name it, put your uh, suggestion in the comments under that post on uh, facebook.com slash paranormal portal radio. If your name is given, given the most likes, whoever gives the most likes wins. So if you want to participate, by all means, p contribute with a name or check out other suggestions, see if there's one you like or add your own. But yeah, that's the coolest little creepy head. <laughs> Uh, I think that's awesome. So thanks so much for a great show. Well, it didn't start out that great, but I think we, you know, with all the technical difficulties, that was, that's unfortunate, but I think it ended up okay, folks. Uh, again, it was just me and you and a whole lot of paranormal, but this is, this is what the show is. This is the, this is the way the show started way back when it was just me and long before Don joined or Sheldon or anybody else ever came on the show, it was just me. And you guys. So some of you, uh, well, I don't know if anybody here was here back when I started, but every once in a while, some of those original people show up still. So it's really cool. But I can tell you what, folks, just remember, I love you all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other, help each other out. Find the magic in every day. And remember to laugh as much as you can. And uh, we will be back on Friday night. We're going to have a, a guest with us. Uh, it's going to be the, um, Bucks County paranormal is going to be joining us on Friday night to talk about some more in their investigations. So we'll get into that on Friday night. And then of course, Saturday night, uh, Sheldon will be here. I, I think Don will be here Friday night. We'll see. Um, if he, if he gets feeling better, certainly hope he can make it. But, uh, if he's still feeling ill, we'll just, we'll just give him our best wishes and hope he gets a, a speedy recovery and gets back in the, back in the saddle. So. That's all I got for you guys tonight. So thank you very much and uh, have a wonderful Thursday. And I will be back on Friday to talk to you more. So until then, folks, I guess that's it. Roll the credits. <laughs>